Our next speaker is an engineering major at Harvey Mudd, <coughs> Mudd uh, College, whose technical interests uh, include signal processing and digital design. His talk today represents an acoustic phased array uh, that is open source and easy to use. Uh, so please welcome our Hackaday Supercon, at our ha Hackaday Supercon stage, Alec Fercruzzi. Thank you. Uh, hi guys, I'm Alec Fercruzzi. Today I'll be presenting on a low cost underwater ultrasonic phased array. Uh, this work was done by, um, at Harvey Mudd College with Professor Matthew Spencer and fellow students Tejas Rao and Ria Zavarchan. Uh, so for a bit of motivation as to why we want to do ultrasonics underwater is that traditional um, electromagnetic waves don't propagate well underwater. At radio frequencies, because water is a conductor, radio waves don't propagate, just the same way that a radio wave doesn't propagate well through metal, uh, it's not going to propagate well through water at um, past non-trivial depths. Oh, sorry. At the same time, um, light doesn't propagate that well through water because, you know, of... Uh, uh, scattering in the water, often there's particles um, that just cause it, make it hard to see. Um, a, sound does propagate extremely well through water, however, um, and we can see an example of that. This is a sonar image in the figure to the right, um, taken of a shipwreck over 200 feet down. Um, so we want to take advantage of uh, acoustic propagation underwater to do uh, fish tracking with an array, and as an intermediate step towards that, we built an underwater 3D imager. Um, we're leading with the results here because we think they're pretty cool. Um, in the figure to the left, you can see um, the array we built um, pointed away from the camera. Um, this is in an underwater test tank. Um, uh, in the background, you see a steel target test plate. Um, and in the figure to the right, we see the point cloud generated by our imager. So the question is, how do we use sound to create an imager? Uh, and the answer is that uh, if we're able to transmit a beam of sound in a specific direction and we're able to steer that beam of sound, all we have to do is steer at different angles in azimuth and elevation, send out a pulse, and if we get an echo from that direction, we know there's something there. Uh, we can use the time that it took the echo to get back to figure out the round trip distance uh, to the target and create a point cloud from that. Um, the figure to the right shows the envelope of a received signal bouncing off of the uh, steel test plate. Uh, so the test plate is around 1.2 meters away, so we can see a big spike here. Um, and this actually, this, this small spike here is due to multipath. It bounces off the uh, test plate and then probably off the back wall behind the array back to the test plate again, effectively doubling the distance. Um, so I'm going to talk about the whole system from the bottom up to describe this imager and how we do this. I've kind of got three sections. Uh, first, we need an element that can create sound. Um, we need to be able to control that sound with a circuit, and then we need to make use those circuits to create a directional beam. Then I'll talk a bit about the results. So first, we need, um, we need an element that can create sound. And so to create sound underwater, you need something that vibrates, um, and a piezoelectric material can do that. Um, a piezoelectric material, when voltage is applied, deforms slightly um, to, cr to create uh, acoustic propagation. And we can understand it, the converse is true as well. Uh, if you deform a piezoelectric material, a material it'll create a, a voltage. And so this piezoelectric material can act as a transducer, which is both a speaker and a microphone. Uh, we can intuitively understand how this works by looking at the unit cell of PZT, which is an extremely common piezoelectric material. Uh, we see in this unit cell um, that we have uh, a positively charged atom that's slightly off center. So there's going to be a bit of a charge distribution um, a positive charge at the top of the unit cell and a negative charge at the bottom of the unit cell. When an electric field is applied, the positive charge wants to move with the field, the negative charge wants to move um, away from the field, and so the unit cell is going to deform. Um, practically, our piezo transducer uh, is shown on the figure to the right. So for some sense of context, this is about uh, 1.6 centimeters in diameter. Um, apologies. The, the um, electric field is applied between two terminals um, this is a hollow sphere. The electric field is applied between two terminals um, on the outer ring and on the inner ring of the transducer. Um, the non-centrosymmetric titanium, or the non-centrosymmetric positively charged atom is kind of uh, pointing inwards here. So when we apply this electric field, um, the hollow uh, uh, um, cylinder is gonna expand and contract, um, which will push water kind of in and out of the transducer, creating a sound wave. Um, 
So now we have the transducers, but to let them, uh, to make them work underwater, we need to do two things, um, which is waterproof them and um, do acoustic impedance matching. So the way we accomplish both of these things, both of these things, is by dipping them uh, into a thin layer of silicone. Um, this accomplishes the waterproofing by just covering the transducers in a thin layer of silicone. Um, but, sorry. By, by covering the terminals of the transducers, and this ac also accomplishes acoustic impedance matching. It turns out that uh, pressure wave cares a lot about the, um, the ratio between the speed of sound of a uh, material and the density of that material, and that's called specific acoustic impedance. This is analogous um, to electrical impedance, which cares about voltage to current. Um, the specific acoustic impedance of silicone is very similar to that of water. So at the boundary between silicone and water um, to a pressure wave, it seems like there's no boundary at all. The specific acoustic impedance of uh, PZT material, however, is much higher than that of water. So it's a kind of a hard to cross boundary. We improve the coupling, um, the power transfer between the water and our transducers by, um, by having our boundary kind of between this be the silicone to water boundary instead of a, uh, the water to PCT boundary. Uh, so now we have the uh, transducers figured out. I'll talk a bit about the circuits that drives uh, a PCT element. Oh, and uh, quickly, uh, this is the array we've made. It's these nine um, silicone uh, dipped elements mounted on a foam plate. Okay, um, so now I'll get into the electronics here. Um, basically, each, there's a channel board, a single channel board that drives a single um, PZT element uh, times nine. Um, on the transmit side, we want to be able to generate a, um, a wave with an arbitrary amplitude, an arbitra a pulsed sine wave with an arbitrary amplitude, arbitrary frequency, arbitrary phase shift, um, and arbitrary like length of the pulse as well. And the way we can do that using a microcontroller and a simple analog front end is by taking advantage of a couple of the peripherals on that microcontroller. Um, so here we have an here we have an analog multiplexer um, that uses um, a PWM peripheral as the select line, and it selects between um, the static output of a digital to analog converter and ground. This produces a square wave with an arbitrary amplitude um, selected by the static to di digital to analog converter and with frequency um, and phase parameters basically selected by the uh, PWM peripheral. We can filter out the harmonics of the square wave to create a sine wave, and we do this with a second order low pass filter, uh, a Salenki topology. Um, we then AC couple the signal um, to zero center it, and it's amplified by a linear um, audio power amplifier, which drives the uh, transducer. On the receive side, um, the signal is uh, filtered with a 60 hertz rejection filter. So this um, filters out things like um, electromagnetic interference from the wall sockets, for example. Uh, then we have a couple op-amp um, stages to do front-end amplification, and it's sampled directly um, by the microcontroller. The microcontroller samples at one mega sample per second, and it uses direct memory access um, to write this uh, into, internal into internal memory of the microcontroller. Samples are then offloaded uh, on an I squared C bus to a host computer to do the processing. Uh, you'll note that we kind of have nine different elements here, and that's ultimately how we're able to create um, um, a sound traveling in a very specific direction, how we can create a directional beam of sound. And the technique we use to do that is with a phased array. Um, so I'm, I'm only going to introduce kind of a phased array uh, very briefly here, um, because it's been done in the past. Um, in 2018 at Supercon, uh, Hunter Scott gave a great presentation um, about phased arrays kind of in the context of RF. Um, this is in the context um, of acoustics, so it's a lot lower frequency. But if, if we take a look um, at a single element, we can see that a single element emanates like a very spherical wavefront. Um, but if we have multiple elements, um, if we have multiple elements uh, emanating wavefronts, and we look at a specific direction, constructive interference is going to make it look like there's one single um, plane wave emanating from that direction. And the key takeaway here is that we can control by, by varying the phase shift um, or you know, the time that each p uh, element fires, we can control the steering angle. So in this case, uh, this element is firing slightly before this one, this one slightly before this one, and vice versa. And so that causes that steering angle to be in this direction. 
But you can imagine if all elements were firing at the exact same time, we'd have zero steering angle. The plane wave would basically be traveling exact, um, away from the, the, the array. Uh, so the figure to the right shows us um, practically implementing this. Um, we have the measured beam pattern here. Um, so this is kind of power versus angle um, of our array. This is steering directly away from the array, steering directly away from the array. And then we, we slightly vary the steering angle to the right more and more. Um, and it does match pretty closely with the theoretical measurements, uh, the, theor the theory, which, which is good. Um, we'll note that this bottom figure here shows that we have to kind of limit our maximum steering angle, and that's due to uh, grading lobes, uh, which is due to the physical setup of the array itself. Uh, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the results. I'll talk a little bit about the results. Uh, this figure here shows the traces at different parts of the transmit chain. Um, we produce this red signal, um, which drives the PZT. And again, to do that, uh, we have this analog multiplexer. Um, the blue trace shows the output of the static DAC. The orange trace shows the output of the analog multiplexer. So we have this arbitrary amplitude um, square wave. After filtering out the harmonics to produce a sine wave, that, that shows this, uh, that's shown by this green trace here. Um, so we can see it's a sine wave. There's a little bit of weirdness here in the front, and that's the settling time of the filter. Um, and then this is zero, uh, zero centered using the AC coupling and then amplified by the power amplifier. Okay, um, so this figure at the bottom here shows the microcontroller sampling the received signal. And so this is a, um, an, a signal, sorry, this is an echo that's coming in at an angle relative to the array. So we see that um, it's a planar wavefront and it's, um, because it's coming in at an angle relative to the array, it's got a slightly different travel time to each element in the array, and that produces this phase shift here. Um, so if we're looking in a very specific, in software, if we're looking in a very specific, uh, if, if we're looking straight out from the array, and we just sum these signals directly, that's gonna produce destructive interference, and so the magnitude of the envelope of the uh, signal isn't gonna be very high. But if we're looking at a, um, if we're looking at the direction that this signal came in, we essentially reverse the delays um, to have these signals, you know, uh, have zero phase shift to each other. If we sum them then, that produces constructive interference that creates an echo with a large magnitude. So that's how we kind of do the received beam forming. Uh, now I'll show the test setup. So these are the uh, PCBs we have. Apologies for all the cabling here. Uh, sorry, it seems like I can't touch this. Um, so this is the motherboard. It houses a central um, multi-channel transmit and receive switch, um, and the piezos are connected to it via twisted pair um, wires, and that just goes into the tank. Uh, then the motherboard is connected to each of the nine channel boards, which has the microcontroller and the analog front end on it, um, using a coax cable for the receive side, which is sensitive signals, and then for the uh, transmit side, just this twisted pair wire. Um, one issue we had in the uh, physically building the system was with synchronization of the sampling. Um, the internal oscillators on the microcontroller, which we were originally using as the sample clock for the ADCs, vary by like plus or minus 5% even after calibration from the factory. And this was completely unacceptable for you know, sampling these signals and trying to do beamforming with them. Um, so we have a one megahertz uh, kind of clock distribution to act as the um, sample clock for the ADC. We also do another synchronization technique as well where we have a signal that basically on the rising edge triggers an interrupt on the microcontroller to start the transmit sequence, and on the falling edge uh, triggers the receive sequence. So uh, using these two techniques, we can basically have uh, synchronous sampling. Uh, so now for the results here. So this is the same um, set of images shown at the beginning. Um, again, with the array here and the test setup here showing this point cloud. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but this point cloud isn't actually rectangular. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of more of a sphere, and this has to do with the point spread function of the imager itself. Um, basically, the beam produced by this array isn't infinitely small, so if we, you know, if we shoot in a specific direction, we're gonna get echoes coming back from another direction that affects our measurement. Uh, the reason this array, the, the, the width of the beam is so large, ultimately has to do with the amount of elements we're using, and um, also kind of how far apart they're spaced, but um, and that's, so that's kind of future work for the project. This image here shows uh, a kind of a 2D slice of that, uh, of that setup. So 
we're just scanning an azimuth now, not an elevation, and so we can see the steel plate here. Uh, okay, uh, so in conclusion, we've open sourced uh, the design files for this, and they're available on GitHub, and we invite you to check it out. Um, also, feel free to email me um, at uh, the uh, email address on this slide. And thank you guys very much for uh, listening.